engineering students. Welcome once again. This is now the uh, kind of second module of your coding work. So for some of you, you've just taken a break and have done some robots. Some of you are continuing straight on from what you uh, were just doing. Either way, we're calling this week 3A of coding. Okay, so we're going to uh, start to get a little more advanced this week. And we're actually going to begin to work towards a little mini final project, which is going to be the main focus of next week. So um, let's start right off with teaching you how to get a little more advanced with your mathematical work, because there's no doubt that one of the main things we want to use Python for is to uh, make our life easier with mathematical calculations. We're going to be using this to code our robots. And as you do that, you've got to take in like variables and inputs and sensor measurements. They're always numerical in nature. And then you manipulate them and make decisions based on that. You know, if sensor value is less than 50, you do this. If it's more than 50, you're going to do this and things like that. And let me say again, I've been so impressed with how well you all are doing. So uh, do not lose heart. If it feels complicated, you can do it and I'm here to help you. So let's get into it. Um, so you might have remembered that we, let's see, like what's a good example? We had, um, okay, let's say side A equals inputs. Tell me, tell me the length of one side of a right angled triangle. I'm going to do a new line so that uh, drops down for the input. And I'm also just going to force this right from the start to be, oh, let's use a float, to be a, uh, a floating point number. Okay, now notice what's happening here. Um, I'm bundling everything all together into one line. They're going to type something in. I'm assuming it's numerical in, in nature, and it's going to turn that into a float straight away, all at once. That's why that's inside the parentheses of float. I am going to save myself some time because I'm, like all coders, a little bit lazy, a little bit efficient. Tell me the length of the other. And let's actually get a little more specific. Let's use the word leg. If we're talking right angle triangles. I don't want them to give me the hypotenuse. I want the legs of the of the other leg. You want the other leg of the right angle triangle. Okay, so we'll get that. And then we're going to do a little calculation here. We're going to say the hypotenuse is, now this is what we did last time. We said um, side A squared. Remember, to, to square something, you use the two um, asterisks. And then we added side B squared. And then we did it to the power of 0 0.5. And then we're going to say, um, the length of the hypotenuse, mind your spelling there, is, and we'll turn that back into a string and we'll do height. And we'll get a little bit of grammar in there, just like that. Okay, I think everything here should work. Notice again, I had to force the float that's coming out here to be a string so that I can concatenate it with that. And again, let me be a good coder here. I'm going to put in some comments. This is a simple hypotenuse. Oh, look at that word. Hypotenuse. Ah, I can't type calculator. Here we go. All right. Tell me length. So one leg of right angle triangle. Um, let me do a 5, 12, 13 triangle. All right, length hypotenuse is 13, excellent. Um, and you know, I'm gonna add one more thing in here. What if it was some like random triangle and I get ugly numbers like that? I am actually going to put in a rounding function. I did tell you about these. I'm gonna to round to two decimal places. This is not significant figures, by the way. This is rounding to how many decimal places. And that is going to help catch issues like that. Now the reason why that says 8.6, I, I think that's because there was an 8.60 coming up. So I think it's clipping that off. 
I can test that by making that three decimal places. Oh, I can't even remember what those numbers were. Drat. I, I just don't even remember. <laughs> oh well. That's what happens when you get into your mid to late 30s. All right, now, there's one thing in, in this program which is a little bit awkward, a little bit clunky. Um, I think we're doing pretty well, but this whole to the power of 0 0.5, this is how I told you to do it earlier. And I did see one person uh, did some research on how to run a square root, because that's what we're supposed to be doing here. When we say um, to the power of 0 0.5 or the power of a half, that is, um, that's identical to a square root symbol. Uh, in the same way you can do a cube root, like put all three in front of the root, that's the same as doing to the power of one third. It's fine to do these things as exponents or as indices, another way to say that, um, plural of index. But here's something else you can do. You can also write import math. And so what this does, this looks into a vast library of um, different modules. I don't know if there's a better word than that. Um, I'm not quite sure, but there's a whole range of different modules that are out there and they're all they're already like pre-built into Python. I'm not 100% sure as to why they don't just always load all the time, uh, you know, as you might expect. It could be to do with like saving memory and resources, you know, because most people don't need to use advanced math functions. But if you do, this is how you make it happen. You start by somewhere in the start of the code saying import math that loads this big library of functions. And then from that point forward, for the rest of the code, instead of doing things like to the power of 0 0.5, let's just get rid of that. You can do this. This right here, math.square or SQRT. Um, so this is looking in the math library and is running the square root function. All right. It's looking in the math library, library running the square root function, and the, it's always separated by a period. And if I've done everything correctly, so you get three, seven, and there it is. Happens exactly the same way. But I think most of us, well, it depends. But you know, you, you might feel that is a little bit more of a um, natural way to write things and think about things than using to the power of 0 0.5. Now we have, um, we have other uh, math functions now as well. Now that we've imported those, and by the way, if you didn't write that in your notebook, please write import space math. Okay, we like math things and you can then write math.sqrt. You can do other stuff as well. You could say, um, let's see. Um, well, let's do this. Let's say angle, angle one. Angle one now is going to be, what have we got here? Look at all these lovely math possibilities. Many of these are familiar. Most of them are probably not because there's a lot of math out there that you guys never done, but you do have things like constants, like pi. You do have uh, radians conversions. Ooh, that could be useful. Um, and I'm sure there are, there it is, degrees conversions. You got cosine, you got hyperbolic cosine, you have no idea what that is, but you have the cosine, you know, you have, um, for those in high level math, you can do log base 10, log base two, you've got uh, sine, square root 10, what else? Truncating, truncating is when you just clip off the numbers, and not rounding, but just clipping off wherever you define it to. Um, infinity, I'm gonna guess that means infinity, what else? Uh, factorial, that's a good one. Factorial is the little exclamation mark. When you say like three factorial, that's one times two times three. Useful in probability. Exponential, that is probably the uh, e to the power of function. There's the constant e. So lots of good things there is what I'm trying to say. 
So we could say this, we could say um, angle one is going to be, no, we probably want arc sine. Arc sine of the two side lengths, side A divided by side, oops, side B. See what I'm doing there? That's arc sine of, oh no, I, I went hypotenuse, sorry. Uh, let's see, sine is defined as, um, with Sokotoa as opposite over hypotenuse. So we're gonna do a side length over hypotenuse. And then we're gonna run the other angle is gonna be arc sine, and we'll just choose the other side this time. If I use the same sine or cosine function, but I just pick the other leg each time, I'm gonna get the two different angles. I don't really care which angle is which. The point is I'm gonna get both of those two different angles and that's a little more advanced, but hopefully, uh, especially the older students understand where I'm going with that. And then we, we can you know, print the output and say um, the three angles for your triangle are 90 degrees, because we know that that has to be true. It's a right angle triangle, we already said that. 90 degrees. Um, We'll convert to a string angle one. Whoops, I need a space there because the pluses, remember, don't give me spaces. Degrees. <laughs> Let's do and. And. No, I need to do string. Angle two is plus. Okay, let's see how that goes. Uh, and I'll do a new line. Those just, oops, those definitely make things a little easier to read. Okay, here we go. Let's do three and seven. Length hypotenuse 7.616, the three angles triangle are 90 degrees. Ooh, these don't feel right, do they? 0.405 degrees and 1.166 degrees. Firstly, it doesn't feel right uh, because there are so many trailing numbers. So let's use a round function. Maybe one decimal place feels about right. Okay, that's going to change that. We have three and seven. Okay, that that. That's easier to read now. However, that's not true, obviously. That's not adding up to the magical 180 degrees that we know we want. Anyone understand what's going on here? It's an issue of um, uh, degrees and radians, okay? Uh, all trig functions natively speak in radians. That's why we have to learn about radians. We naturally think in terms of degrees, so what we're gonna do as well is we're gonna oops, we're gonna take advantage of our degrees function. I've actually never used this, but I'm pretty sure I know what it does. Okay. You can actually see the little help file appears there by the way. Convert angle X from radians to degrees. Now before I click play, look really carefully at what is happening here. We have the arc sine, math dot, math dot arc sine, which is doing that ratio of the side to the hypotenuse, which remember is the definition of sine. Sine of an angle equals opposite of hypotenuse, which means arc sine of opposite of hypotenuse equals the angle. That is inside the parentheses for math dot degrees. So that's gonna take that radians answer and convert it to degrees. Ninth graders, maybe 10th graders, you don't understand as well what radians is talking about, but that's okay. And then maybe some spaces might make it a bit easier to read as well. And then after you get the answer, the rounding function with the first argument being all of this and the second argument being how many decimal spaces, the one, that rounds it off and then puts it into angle one. That is a float 
value at that point. So that's why we have to turn it to a string down here. Let's try this again. That feels better. We could even do a quick little angle check. Angle check, 90 plus. Um, string one. Now this is a bit funny here. I'm, I've got pluses that are in the quotes and I've got pluses that are black. See like the, the red ones are in the quotes but the black ones are, um, yeah, like, you know, one of them is a piece of text and one of them is concatenating multiple pieces of text. Angle check 90 plus that plus that. Be careful here. Equals. And then this is me actually checking, checking that those, those do equal out to be 180 degrees. Okay, this might, might feel a little complex, but again, watch what's happening. I'm actually adding, like in a math kind of way, I'm adding 90 plus the angle measure plus the angle measure. So if all is well, that little sum there should end up equaling 180 if I've done my job in the rest of the program. It's turning that into a string, and then it's saying, using text, that 90 plus angle one plus angle two, and we'll see with our eyes if those two sides of the equation actually balance out. They do. Okay, so this is this is good. So this 180 in the output right here, that 180 is actually a calculated value. That's nowhere in my text strings. It didn't have to say 180. Uh, if my programming was wrong, like if my programming you know, if I accidentally, let's say I, I did this, I don't know why I would do this. Let's say I had like a wrong formula to calculate things. See, I, I wouldn't necessarily get 180 degrees coming out of that. Right now it says 191.6 because I intentionally put some wrong math into there. So the fact that I did get 180 is good. All right, so that, that was about, you know, 18 minutes worth of, of showing you how to use the import math um, commands to bring in the math module and then some of the ways you might use that. I think for the most part you're going to be using the square root function, uh, degrees and radians conversions, and then the three trig ones. Sine, cosine, tangent, arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent. If you are one of the younger students and you've forgotten how to do sine, cosine, arc sine, what all that means, um, you've got it all in your notes from first semester. Um, it's also easy to look up. You can also ask me about it. I don't want you to feel too confused, but um, I think the basic ideas still stand. You can import math functions and then you can use them. Okay, part two of today is, um, is going to be about something called functions. And this is this is kind of a big idea. I think I will comment these out as I go. So functions, like I've been using functions this whole time. So when I do like math.sqrt, that is a square root function. Now what is a function? In mathematics and programming and all sorts of other applications, a function is where some kind of input is received. Okay, using functions, where an input is received, some kind of operation gets done on it, and an output is, let's say, produced. Okay, that's like the definition of what a function is. So, um, like sine that we've been talking about, sine is a function. When you put in an angle to the sine function, it's like a little box, it's like a little machine. Okay, you put in the angle and then 
that spits out the other end uh, a ratio of the opposite to the hypotenuse. You can think of a square root as, you know, as I said, we have it right here. You can think of a square root as being a function. It's like a little machine. It's like a little box, like a little, like a little you know, factory that when you put in a 16 into that box, it goes and then it spits out a four. You put in a nine, it spits out a three. And it's like, man, what's happening there? It's like magic. How does that keep coming out? And of course it has rules that are making it do that. The rule is that we're looking for a number that when multiplied by itself gives the original. That's the rule. But um, you can create functions that do almost anything. The whole point is they run according to rules. Okay, or I use the word an operation. Okay, they always run according to a set of rules. And those can be mathematical rules, those can be verbal rules. Like, um, here's another example, which you're going to see later on. If you know how to speak Pig Latin, okay, Pig Latin. Pig Latin is where, um, if you're not familiar with Pig Latin, it's a little bit of kind of like an old British thing, I think. Um, but Pig Latin is where you take the first consonant of a word that you're saying, you move it to the end of the word, and then you put the letters A-Y. Okay, like Pig Latin. Whoops. So the word um, food, let's say, you take the F and you put it to the end and then you put the letters A Y. So it udfe. Okay? The word food becomes udfe. And if you do this quickly enough and with a nimble enough brain, you can actually speak like that. If you've never done this, never heard of this, then I'm 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 sorry because it's really fun. But um then I think when you have an a vowel at the start of the word, you can just always use like lay or like the like L A Y or something like that. So like it lay is lay erive unfe ute ixpe igpe atin lay. It is very fun to speak pig Latin. That's pig Latin. But every word is being manipulated according to a function. It's a set of rules. Take the consonant, move it to the end, add the letters ay with a hyphen. If there is no consonant, you just say the word lay. Okay, just like use letter L. Okay. It lay, is lay, erive, easy lay. Ute, ixpe, igpe, atin lay. <laughs> So, um, because it runs code of rules, we can consider that a function. So in Python, we want to be able to, to write functions so that when we want to run a particular set of rules, we can do it over and over again. You know, we just use the math.degrees function twice. And there's like all sorts of things going on in the back end of a calculation like that. Uh, converting ratings to degrees means that you actually multiply the number by 180 and divide it by pi. But 180 and pi never appeared in the code because they're on the back end of this math.degrees function. And some programmer out there has already def defined all these functions and has bundled them together into the math module, which is why we don't need to think about it, which is why it's helpful. So we're gonna write our own functions. Um, and here's how it works. You start with letters DEF. DEF stands for define. Okay, we're going to define a function. Again, get your notebooks, write this down. This is really important. Your robots will have functions. And the functions will be things like this. You, you give your function name. Um, oh, let's see. Okay, we're gonna do we're gonna do kind of a cheap version of Pig Latin. We haven't really done enough to do full Pig Latin yet, but that is gonna come up. So we're gonna do a cheap Pig Latin where we just simply put the letters a y onto the end of every on the end of every single word. So you write the word def, put a space, then you come up with a name for your function. This is the name of the function. This is what you're going to call to whenever you want to run the function. 
just like someone here called their function degrees or a sine. The math is just referring to the module. This is what we're doing. We're naming a function. So make it easy to remember, make it relevant to what you're actually doing. And then you um, you have to have open close parentheses straight after. Now I'm going to firstly show you a kind of a simple function which doesn't do a whole lot. Oops, and I forgot one thing. You got to have the colon at the end with the spaces. All right, so this function is just going to do this. I like pig Latin, even the cheap kind. And we're going to do that. That's what. That's just what we're going to do. Um, and then I, you know, I do my. Oops, I do my backspaces. The function is done. It's kind of like if else, if elif else. It's like while statements. You have the colon. Anything that is in the function, this little vertical line will show up. It's indented by two spaces. And as soon as you, you delete those double spaces and go back to the main indent, then that wraps it up. Okay, that's how this kind of program works. So you define your function, you give it the name, you do open close parentheses, you do the colon, and then you put whatever you want to be inside the function. It's done. If I run this code now, is something wrong? Is something wrong? No, nothing's wrong. This is what our code says right now. Because, okay, first of all, I commented out everything there, but left it for you so you can look at it. But all this did, this, this just defined what the function is. It's not actually running the function. So you always start with defining the function, describing it if you like, but until you actually call the function, that's what it's called, you call the function, until you call it, it doesn't get run or used. It's like a little mini sub program or a subroutine. It's there, and look, you can even minimize it if you want to, but until you actually use it, it doesn't do, it just sits idle. So you have to then do things like this, cheap, cheap pig Latin, and I think you need the open close parentheses. And as often as you do that, so I just typed it twice, see that? It's going to run what is inside your function you know, as many times as you call to it, that's what it's going to do. So because I typed this once, it's going to do it and that's it. You can, you can work this into, into other kinds of functions and structures and stuff. Uh, you know, you could say, um, oh, I don't know. Um, Uh, now I'm going to do float, float input between negative 100 and, oops, 100. I'm doing a float because of the smart Alex out there who are going to do like 0 0.05 instead of just whole number integers. And then we can say if answer is greater than 10, then we're going to run that twice just because. Otherwise, nah. We're only going to run it once. Okay, let's see if this works. Give me a number between negative 110, negative 99. Okay, it went to the else. It ran the function cheap pig Latin once. But if I do a big number, 80, I'm going to hit the if answer greater than 80. And so I get this result here. Okay, I get it running two times. This is obviously a weird example, but 
Uh, I hope you can see how it, it could actually be used. It's going to bug me. <laughs> right. Cool. Okay, that is a very, very simple function. Very, very simple functions um, are simply like a little cluster of instructions and they're things that you might want to run more than once. If you know that you're only going to, you know, say the words, I like pig Latin, even the cheap kind. If you know that you would only ever say that one time somewhere in your code, you'd probably just put print that. But if you know that this is some kind of thing or process or a set of statements that is just going to constantly come up, and that's often the nature of computing, then you're really wise to create a function and then just keep calling that function every time you want it. You'll find that your code is shorter, more efficient, there's less characters, fewer lines. Um, you could use this, you know, imagine like, you, like doing like a like a role-playing text-based, a text-based role-playing game. And, you know, you want to, like every time you shoot your Blaztec DL44 blaster, to try to hit Greedo, um, the computer has to like do do like a dice roll in the background, a die roll, um, and calculate the probability that you hit. Like all of that would be something that might happen over and over again every time you click the trigger of your blaster. Okay, every time you want to see if the computer says like, did you hit the alien or did you not? Um, when you get to a doorway, do you walk in? Do you walk backwards? Do you turn left, turn right? That could be something that happens every time you run into a doorway. So that would be an example of something you might bundle, you might wrap it up into a function and just have that function call every time. All right, let me show you how to uh, make these get a little more advanced. Um, we will say, that's interesting. I'll just jump two spaces. I thought, okay, this is going to be better pig Latin. And the reason why this one is going to be better, maybe like a little more advanced, still won't be the real full thing. It's because we are going to introduce a variable here. And I'm going to put that right here. Sorry, I, I used the word variable. That was wrong. I'm going to put this right here. This is an argument. This is an argument for the function. I did mention arguments, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Um, arguments are like the, the things that can get passed to a function. That's the right way to say it. You pass arguments to a function. The, the, those are the things that drop into the box, into the machine, so that you can get the right output. Um, this function here, the cheap pig Latin function, was actually like a closed box that doesn't accept inputs. It just gives outputs every time. Okay, it's like a little machine that, as long as it's on, it just always you know cranks out the same hamburger every time. You don't need to give it variables of, you know, whatever. It just does it. That's why the parentheses here didn't have anything in them. But now we're going to put an argument in there. So now we can actually have control over what goes into the machine and probably that's going to affect, if we set it up that way, what comes out of the machine. So let's see. We're going to say, um, <clears throat> we're going to print word plus a, like hyphen a y. Okay, so something's going to drop in there it's i'm naming it i come up with my own name for it i'm going to call it word and then every time this runs it's going to print this thing and then it's going to add a y again if i run this my weird little program this is not running the better pig latin function it's not running it because i haven't called it yet all I did was I defined it. Okay, I set it up. I haven't used it. Here we go. Let's use it now. Um, all right, let's say, um, tell me. Let's 
do input, oops, input, tell me a word. And so it's going to wait for the input. It's going to put it in a variable called tell me. And then we do this. We're going to say better. Oh, I didn't get my B. I don't know why. Better pig Latin. Now I open those parentheses. And I'm going to put that variable that I just invented. It's right here. It's a string right now. Something is in there, a word is in there, whatever I typed in, and it is going to pass that to the function. So that is now the thing which goes into the box right here. Now inside the function, that that input, that argument is has been called word. So then within the function, it's using the same word, word, it's adding that to it. And all of that is encapsulated right here on line 33. Okay, the input variable tell me is going to get passed to better pig Latin, which then gets used throughout it. Let's see how this goes. Tell me a word. Um, elephant. Elephant day. Okay, just going to add that on. Anytime a word gets passed to that function, it's going to pop out the same thing with hyphen ay. Right now, it doesn't seem like we're saving a lot of time. We're creating a two line function to do something which could have been done on one line here, but it doesn't take a lot of imagination to realize that there could be a lot inside that function. Um, like you might even have a logic structure in here that says something like if, okay, it's hard, it's hard for me to do this because there's a lot of stuff we haven't done yet. Um, if word, I'm gonna give you a little sneak preview here. I hope I'm doing this correctly. Where is it? If word zero equals a or no, A, E, ah, what am I doing? Hold on. Can you see what I'm getting at here? A, E, I, okay. A, E, I, O, or you. If my word begins, those, those little square, square brackets, that, that's a new trick here. This is actually called slicing. Okay, I'm going to put this in. Uh, let's slice the first letter of the word. That's what that does. The zero stands for the first letter, okay? Like with that range function we looked at, uh, counting in computer science often begins with a zero. So the first letter in the word is the zeroth word, not the first word, it's the zeroth word. So word square brackets zero means grab the first letter of the word. That's called slicing, we're gonna look more at that later. I think I'm doing this correctly. I didn't mean to get into this, but here I go. Um, We're going to print the word plus L-A-Y. However, if the word doesn't start with an A-E-I-O-U, but it obviously then would have to start with a consonant, then it's just going to print the word. Oh, no, 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 we can, we can do, we can do better here. And we, we suddenly got really complicated. I hope I haven't lost too many of you. This is now gonna write, oh no it's not. Well, it's gonna, it's gonna write the whole word, but then it's also gonna grab the sliced first letter of the word 
and attach that along with the AY. Man, I don't know if this is going to work. If this was a really good Python program, it would remove, if this was a full pig Latin, this is, this is better, it's not perfect. It would have removed the consonant from the start. I'm not actually doing that. Oh, if word zero. Did anyone see that mistake? I'm embarrassed. I did a comparison. When you do a comparison between two things, you're supposed to use double equal sign, aren't you? The single equal sign is just used for defining variables. Oh dear. If all of that is true, where do we go wrong? This is good. Line 34, we went wrong. Oh, I see what I did wrong. Do, do, like, do, do you, try to actually read this red writing. See, I'm, first of all, it's telling me on line 34, there's an issue. Okay, line 34 right here. And then it says indentation error. I expected an indented block. It scolds me. It's right. After a colon, I should have indented. That's completely my fault. Let's try that again. Uh, 50. Great. Tell me a word. Um, <coughs> aardvark. Aardvarkle. Ooh, that worked. Okay. It picked up on the fact that aardvark starts with an A, that the sliced first letter was A or E or I or O or U. That, was, that came back as true because one of those five things was true. And so it printed the word together with lay. If I now run it and I say um, Dartmouth, it says Dartmouth, Dartmouth Day. Okay, it grabbed that D and it put it to the end. Now, I confess I'm going to have to go look up how to get rid of that first letter off the front. Um, I think what it's going to involve me doing is counting the number of letters in the word using the LEN function, which we should be in your notes. We learned that, I think, in our, maybe our very first lesson, which is the length of the word, L-E-N. Then you put the word in there, counts length, and then I need to use that to count off what to slice with. Um, all right. But all of this is just trying to show you. I know I got a little complex there. It's just trying to show you that this is all just contained in the definition of the function better pig Latin, which can receive one argument, and that is a, a word of text. So now, anytime I'm writing the main program, which actually starts down here on line 37, anytime I want to convert a word into better pig Latin, I just write better pig Latin and I pass a text string to it, and it will take care of it all on the back end without me having to write all of this every time. Now, once again, this is by no means perfect. If I write, um, <clears throat> I dreamed a dream in time gone by. That's not a word, but it's going to say, I dreamed a dream in time gone by, lay. Oh, actually, it's capital I-A, because uh, I didn't use a lower. Okay, I didn't use a lower thing to force the uh, first letter to be lowercase. So even the capital I escaped my logic statement here. Do you see that? My logic statements here were only looking for lowercase a, lowercase e, lowercase i, lowercase o, lowercase u. A lowercase i completely fooled it. So that will be something to improve on. And the fact that it's a whole sentence, it didn't pick up on that. There are ways to make it pick up on that. It didn't. It just couldn't. Okay. So, man, we've we've gone through a lot here. Now, functions obviously can uh, do other things. Um, they can uh, do mathematical work. They can do work with words. They can have logic structure inside of them. Like anything at all can be in there. Um, my my little project for you this time. Let me just take a quick look at it. One second, remind myself. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, I would like you to do this. I want to write a program 
that uses a function. It could even use more than one function if you like, but I want, I want you to prove to me you know how to use functions. Use a function. The program, wow, will, um, will describe marbles in a, a bag let's say colored marbles in a bag and the probability of taking your color out of it. Let me describe a little more what I mean. So um, maybe you have read these kind of math problems before where um, you know it says yeah, let me give you an example here. Oh, better pig line. Why did that show up? I think I clicked something by accident. Um, like imagine a bag with 20 marbles in it. Maybe uh, five red and 15 blue. What is the probabil probability of reaching in and picking out a red, a red marble, a red marble. Now, I'm hoping you know enough about probability to know that probability is all about fractions, and it's all about the outcome you want divided by all the possibilities. Okay, whatever you want is the numerator. And all the possibilities are the denominator. So in this case, probability is going to be five. There are five red marbles out of 20 total marbles. Now that uh, five out of 20 is, uh, is, you know, you could list that as 0.25 is the probability, or you could say 25%. Either of those two answers would be completely fine. So that's the kind of program I want you to write. I'd like you to, as with everything, make it kind of interactive. The, the full interactivity would be to actually ask the person how many marbles are in the bag. And then you might say, um, there's a lot of ways you could do this. You might say like, how many of the marbles are red? Or you might say, like, you know, list off for me how many red, how many blue, how many yellow, how many purple that they put in the numbers. And that tells you, like, what's the what's the population of marbles in the bag, you know, colors and distributions. A, a simpler version would be to tell the user there are 20 marbles, five are red, 15 are blue, and then take it from there. So, um, you know, try to match that to your skill level but then um, I want it to tell the user what the probability is of getting that red or blue or whatever colored marble it is and I want you to do this using a function this may not be the absolute best reason to use a function something like this but I I think it's it, it's within the bounds of you know something that would be appropriate basically all of the calculating work is going to be inside the function and so you are simply going to call to that function and uh, and have it do the work anytime you want to to run the program you you could even put this in a in a loop you may decide to use some other stuff we've learned like um like uh loop it infinitely with like a while true loop you might um continually ask the user do you want to do this experiment again with like a while while the person says yes you know we're going to keep running this something like that try to use some tips and tricks that we have been looking at along the way that will impress me greatly uh, you probably don't need to use the math functions the import math for this because uh, probability is simply just simple division but you may find that you want to use the round function because it's going to come back with a lot of decimals in your float answer. You might want to clip those off. Um, yeah. You may want to multiply the simple division 
by 100 to get to the percentage and then stick the little percent sign on as a, as a piece of text. So lots of, lots of possibility here. You can take this as far as you want. I look forward to seeing the outcomes. Please uh, see me, email me, uh, share your code with me if you are getting stuck. And make sure you attach your code to your assignment when you turn it in. It makes it way easier for me. All right, thanks guys. We're all done for the day. We'll see you later.